So I ended up putting two coats of primer on the pedestal, more so to be on the safe side. You can kind of see the stain through it a little bit. It probably would be fine with just one, but I feel like it was worth it to put two on. So now I'm going to top coat it and I'm putting a latex acrylic on there, semi-gloss. This is just paint I had laying around from another job. And I'm going to end up putting two coats of this on and then it will be ready to be shabby chic. So the key to multiple layers of paint is to lightly sand in between. So I just finished sanding this. And in between I use like a 120 grit and that just will not only make it smooth but it will knock down all the all the high spots on time like this you'll get some raised grain from after painting and that just takes it all off. So I put the last a uh, layer of top coat on this last night and it, I let it dry obviously overnight and now it's going to be ready to be shabby chic or distressed however you want to phrase it. There are six layers of finish on this. Two layers of stain, two layers of primer, and two layers of top coat. And then underneath all of that obviously is the base wood. And the goal for something like this is to see those three layers as well as the wood underneath. Personally, I think shabby chic looks the best when it does look like it has naturally, over time, lost paint and spots. So to go at it in the spots where that would most normally occur is what is going to look best. So all the ridges of your piece are great spots to start with shabby chic. Ridges where things might hit corners are good spots and then this customer wants it to be even a little bit more distressed so I'll go in and hit these any sort of high spots on top of that high spots here and high spots here and then I'll probably send them a picture and they'll tell me whether or not they like it and then um, either go back and do some more or not what I am using to reveal all those layers is going to be my orbital sander. I have an 80 grit piece of paper on there, but I've used it before. So it's not going to be as um, strong as if it was a fresh pad. And to start, this is a variable speed orbital sander. I'm going to put the speed <clears throat> down to the lowest setting because with those six layers, it's going to be much easier to go back and take more off versus covering up if too much comes off at once. So the one obvious advantage to shabby chic is if you're not a great painter or you don't you didn't use a finishing sprayer on something like this, the best spots to shabby chic are the ones where there's mishaps in the paint. Or if after you paint for the night and a bug suicide bombs into your finish and leaves a disgusting black mark, this is a great spot to then shabby chic.
Once I have the basic patch revealed, I'm going to go in with a chisel and clean it up. And the reason for that is you can see, like, as you continue to use that pad and the pad gums up, it just kind of starts to move the paint around as it heats up instead of completely removing it. And that chisel can go through pretty easily and take off that built up paint. Not only that, but you could see in the photo you have your top coat, which is a very, very bright white, but Kills kind of has a gray hue to it. And I want to see the least amount of that Kills as possible because it was primer, it was not really in the original plan. And then obviously here's the paint underneath with the stain on it. So the chisel also helps in going through and removing some of that primer. So I finished shabby shaking this and I'm going to apply this Rust-Oleum triple, triple Thick Urethane. I've used this before, I really like this stuff. It also goes on clear and it won't yellow. So I'm putting that on the base and before I do that, this has the, the paint I use has a glossy finish. I'm just going to go through with my uh, orbital sander on a low setting and like 120 grit pad on it and just lightly go over the whole thing without applying any pressure. I don't want to remove any of the paint just to smooth everything out. I don't have a dust-free environment that I could pour the epoxy on this tabletop in. So I set up this old tent that I won't really mind if the, some epoxy gets on it um, in my backyard. I leveled the table on top of four paint cans with some shims. Since this is self-leveling epoxy, I wanted this surface as level as possible. And then I went over the surface because I final sanded it before I brought it out here with some paint thinner. And now I'm going to let the, any dust that's still in the air settle for about an hour or so before I start messing with the epoxy on top of this. I'm starting off my morning by pouring the seal coat on my tabletop. I have the tabletop in the tent. It's actually a little cool out for this. It should be like 75 degrees when using this product. It even says it on the bottle. But inside the tent, obviously, it's warmer. It's actually about 75 in there versus the outside temperature. So I think I'll be able to get away with starting the pour this morning. So in order to start this process, unfortunately, you have to do a little bit of math. And this product I'm using, the Pro Marine Supplies Epoxy, is comes with, uh, there's a link to instructions online, obviously read them, and it'll tell you for the seal coat how much resin and how much hardener you need. So my tabletop is circular, so I'm going to obviously calculate it for square feet, but I should have a little bit extra which each, with each mix, which is, which is a nice uh, cushion to have. So for one square foot, you're going to need three ounces total of product and uh, an ounce and a half of each, the hardener and the resin. So I calculated my square footage by multiplying 4.5 by 4.5 and that comes to 20.25. I rounded it down to 20 because it is a circle and I won't have corners. So if you're using an ounce, so at 1.5 ounces of each, I got um, 30 ounces of the hardener and 30 ounces of the epoxy for the seal coat, which is 60 total ounces. So I'll know I can mix that up. The most important part when doing anything that cures versus something that dries is getting the ratio um, exact. And they'll tell you multiple times in these instructions, if you don't mix this properly, it will not cure. So I spent the extra money and got these mixing cups and they even have 
the ratio on the side that will tell you how much you need of each but also they tell you milliliters and ounces so I know that if I pour 30 ounces of each which is almost the whole container I'll have enough for my gel coat. So I have the two measured out and the hardener is much more viscous than the resin. So just be careful when you're pouring out the resin. You'll notice since it's so thick that the slower you go, the better the chances of getting the right measurement. So I'm going to add the hardener to my bucket. Then I'm going to add the resin. Now the key to the seal coat is you're covering the material, which in this case is painted wood. So you want to make sure that paint has ample time to dry or your finish could fish eye if there's any moisture left in the wood or the paint. So the seal coat just covers all those pores so you have less of a chance of getting air bubbles in the final product. Now the key to this epoxy is going to be mixing it thoroughly and for the amount I have this is probably going to take four to five minutes. You want to practice scraping the sides of your bucket to make sure there's no buildups in the corner, especially since the resin is much thicker than the hardener. You don't want to whip it because that will introduce air into the mixture. And what's going to happen is the mix is going to get cloudy, white cloudy, and then once it's completely clear, you'll know you're done. So I've been mixing for about a minute or so, and you could see it's still pretty cloudy. It's the next morning and the seal coat is dried really nicely. There's a couple little spots like right here where it missed a little bit, but I think that will be fine for the flood coat and there's really nothing stuck in the finish, which is really nice. Now you might have noticed yesterday when I poured this, I was using a different bucket and that is because I did not heed my own advice on the first pour and this is what happened. I thought I could get away with a couple degree difference but it was just too cold when I started mixing the epoxy and it just wasn't, um, it was staying cloudy, the mix wasn't turning clear so that means the chemical reaction wasn't happening. So I kind of put it in a, the bucket in a hot water bath to heat up and I think that would have worked, I just kept it in there too long and then it just completely solidified in about 30 seconds in the bucket. So just pay attention to those manufacturer instructions. I've done this before and you know sometimes you're rushing which was part of the problem and this is probably about 30 bucks worth of epoxy. Luckily I had enough to do the second, the, uh, to retry it but I'm not going to have enough to do the flood coat so I had to overnight some more epoxy from Amazon which luckily with Amazon that's not even super expensive so I'm gonna do the flood coat today and the other downside of the situation even though this turned out nicely and I'm much happier than I was at this time yesterday um, the window for pouring the flood coat on top of the seal coat so it sticks is four to ten hours if you go past that, which obviously I have, you have to sand the entire surface with 120 grit or 220 grit sandpaper and then remove all of the dust with denatured alcohol. So that's just now an extra step I wouldn't have had to do if I mixed this properly the first time. But you live and you learn and I'm waiting for that shipment to come and once it comes I could pour the flood coat and then let this sit. It takes three days to fully cure but you can tell already from this one that it, you know it's hard enough to touch and to move around.
So since I waited more than 10 hours before recoat, I'm going to sand the surface with 220 grit sandpaper and then wipe the whole thing down with denatured alcohol. I'm going to keep my scratches going, the scratch marks from the sandpaper going in one direction, but once you put the flood coat on, it's going to cover all of those marks. Once I've sanded the surface, I'm going to remove all that fine dust with denatured alcohol. Now they recommend this over other products and they specifically warn about using paint that are for this part. So I don't know if you could see on there, but the mix now is pretty cloudy. And you can kind of see in there. So it's starting to clear up now. I don't think you could see super well on this camera, but it's starting to clear up and there's only a little bit of those white, wispy, uh, cloudy strands left in there. And you're mixing it until it's crystal clear and you don't see any of that whiteness. So I've been mixing this for about eight minutes and it's, I used the purple container this time so it would be easier to see the white and when I take the dip out you can see there's no cloudiness in there in the epoxy and I can't see any cloudiness in the container. So I'm going to get ready to pour this. Now when it comes time to spread this out I'm just going to dump this across the whole table and then put the container aside. You do not want to scrape anything out of the bottom because it might not be properly mixed. Once you're done spreading this around, you'll notice that there are air bubbles on the surface. And the way to deal with that is to take a propane torch and light it and just sweep over the surface of the piece. You can see those air bubbles. And so, so that is the surface and the instructions recommend staying in here for at least a half an hour after you pour this you flood coat it to watch for air bubbles and I am going to do that because I don't want to ruin this with air bubbles. <laughs> 